So it's great to be in Plymouth, um, and it also is great in the film to see the impact that New Hampshire has had on the great, on the thinking that is changing healthcare in this country. I think we should all be very proud of our colleagues at Dartmouth and the Dartmouth Institute and Dartmouth Hitchcock. It gives me a great level of confidence in the care that we have access to at the at the at that at the academic medical center that's um, serving most, especially this part of the state. And uh, we have an exceptional panel here to share their thoughts with you, and, and then we're going to have time to take your questions. I see a lot of people who are also experts in this room, and we want to have time, plenty of time for you to chime in about your community, about New Hampshire, and uh, to ask uh, questions of any of us, including, and we'll ask questions of you as well. So as Don mentioned, um, I'm uh, Jean Ryder. I'm the director of the New Hampshire Citizens Health Initiative. And I want to also introduce my colleague, Holly Tutko. Would you please wave, Holly? And Holly uh, works with me on the initiative. Uh, we have a team that works out of Durham and Bow, and she's also a clinical assistant professor at UNH. So she's a very valued colleague, and I'll talk about some of the work that she helps with uh, in a minute. So the initiative is a convener and a catalyst for health system change. We're trying to lead New Hampshire's healthcare system to what's called the triple aim, better health, better care, and lower cost for all of New Hampshire's residents. We bring people together, stakeholders, the public, business, to work on issues that are compelling and that everyone realizes they can't solve them alone. So among those things, and, and I think things will start to sound a little, some of them will sound a little familiar to you. Uh, we have right now, in fact, meeting right now, some of Fred's colleagues are meeting on what we call the Accountable Care Project. Some of them are also in the back of the room. Uh, and uh, if, uh, learning how to measure, use the data that we have from New Hampshire's uh, 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 extensive database of claims information, and use that and, and quality measures to figure out how well they're taking care of the patients they're responsible for and the communities they're responsible for and how to measure and, and, and work on that. So we've got 15 uh, different kinds of health and human service providers working together um, to figure out how to do that. Uh, and we are part of a national project funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. We're just wrapping up a multi-payer, um, a commercial, we, a, a medical home pilot for the commercial insurance um, companies that uh, Mid-State Health Center was part of. And uh, that is showing really very promising results uh, uh, and the potential to reduce costs and unnecessary um, health, utilization of health care. We are always uh, working on issues of health promotion and disease prevention. Uh, Holly's been working on that for quite some time and we're particularly interested now in integrating public health with clinical care. Uh, our focus at the beginning is going to be on the issue of tobacco, which remains a significant problem in our state, especially with our young people and our young women. And Holly is leading the way on that effort. Our newest project is called the Roadmap for New Hampshire's Health. You'll be convening stakeholders, pulling together the data to show where New Hampshire's health is now, what our population looks like now, what it's going to look like in the future, and what our health and health care system are going to be looking like going forward. And then we can have you know, conversations around the state about what we need to do to adapt to that future and possibly change some of the trajectories that we see coming. I live um, in Sandwich, which is in Carroll County, one county over, and the population projections for Sandwich are that by 2030, more than 50% of the residents, I mean, for Carroll County, the whole county, well, more than 50% of the residents will be over 65. I can tell you that Carroll County does not have the infrastructure to support a population that is aging at that rate. So um, I want to introduce our panelists. Um, and uh, first, Fred Kelsey. Dr. Fred Kelsey is a familiar face, I think, in the Plymouth community. He's a board-certified uh, internal medicine physician. He has, uh, works now as a medical director at Mid-State Health Center. And I don't want him to be a prophet without honor in his own land. So I need you to know that Fred and Mid-State have been enormously helpful to the initiative both on the Accountable Care Project, where he served on uh, the first set of clinical committees, and now he's working with us on figuring out what to measure and how to measure it and how to report it. 
also on the medical home pilot. So we were um, very grateful for the time he spends going up and down Route 93 to come to meetings in uh, Concord. And um, Tom Bunnell is an attorney, a public policy advocate uh, with New Hampshire Voices for Health and uh, the Institute for Health Law and Ethics at the University of New Hampshire Law School. Longtime colleague and uh, Steve Gorin is from our host here at Plymouth, professor, professor of social work at Plymouth State, and also the um, chair of the State Committee on Aging and a current president of the New Hampshire um, the part time executive director, part time executive director of the New Hampshire uh, Social Work Association. So, um, our theme of the discussion and we will also take this where you want to go with it, is what do we want to be the good news about healthcare in New Hampshire? In New Hampshire? What are the building blocks that we already have in place? What do we need to do to move our local communities and our state and our health systems toward the kind of future that we're seeing here? And I think to some degree we see parts of it in our community here. So Fred, I want to start with you. The medical director at Mid State, you've been providing health care in this community for a number of years. Some of these practices are quite familiar to you. I know that you're using them at Mid State. And what are you working on and what do you wish you could do to move to the next level? Um, this film, I, this is not the first time I've seen it, and every time I see it, I get, um, as Sharon Beatty says, I get the vapors. Um, <laughs> It's really where you want to go, and it really resonates if you're a, a clinician taking care of patients, because that's really what you signed up to do. And when you look at systems that really support that, it's a very cool feeling, and it really makes you want to do it more. I thought what I'd do, I have lots of notes, because I'm an internist, so I'm very detail-oriented. But what I think I'm going to do is just go through each community and talk about what they had and what we have here and then kind of go from where we'd like to go next. Grand Junction, um, I would have loved a minute fly on the wall to see how they pulled that off. Um, talk about lots of different, you know, tribes, if you will, vying for different things. And to come together 20 years ago to basically build an ACO, which is what they did. Um, and it's, it's, it's humbling to hear that story, because that's the way it really ought to be. The Grand Junction represents, you know, an accountable care organization. Um, we have one uh, being birthed in Plymouth. Uh, we have what's known as the North Country Accountable Care Organization, of which Mid State Health is one of four federally qualified health centers that are raised as we go north. Um, we were one of the first five in the United States to participate in the advanced payment shared savings, Medicare pilot. Um, this was, this is an honor, and we take it very seriously, and it's been actually pretty fascinating, even though we don't know what we're doing yet. So, ACOs exist. Um, we've been working on a pilot, as Jeannie mentioned, for a couple of years to see if we could do this on a statewide um, level. Uh, we learned interesting things in that 18 months of meetings. We're not there yet, but that's actually going to occur. Group health really represented two things. One, the medical home, and the key piece of electronic records. Uh, we've had electronic records in Plymouth since 2003. Um, it was prophetic that we start on April Fool's Day on that year. It's been a struggle. It's not easy. Um, we grumble about it every day, and yet not one clinician we go back to paper. Um, and without the medical, the electronic record, you would not be able to do a medical home. Medical homes, I sort of tongue in cheek, um, when that when the rubric came out, I said, "Geez, that's what we used to do back in 1978, 79, 80, when I was young and very inexperienced." But that's what you did; you took care of patients. And now we sort of lost that through the wilderness of different payment mechanisms, and now we're coming back to medical home which is a nice catchphrase for the patients in the middle of their care, and that's really what we should be focused on. Um, we've been a certified medical home 
for three years. We just were recertified, just like if those of you who've been in the hospital environment, it's just like Jayco, every time you do it, it gets harder. Um, it's a great model. Um, our feedback for our patients is very positive, and I can tell you that practicing in it as a clinician is very gratifying, um, as you get to do more and more what you really wanted to do. Ever Clinic, they, they really highlighted two things that, that we're doing as well. Um, first, I'm going to jump to drugs and pharmacy. Years ago, it was pretty clear that with pharmacy benefits and different, different ways of paying for drugs and so forth and different rules, that there was no way that um, we could keep up with that. And we actually assigned a person that their job was just to manage all the prescriptions. Because they would start figuring out all the little dinky rules that the insurance company would come up with that they'd never tell you, which would be just a hassle to try to get your prescription. And indeed, we were able to pilfer all the prior authorization forms and all those kind of tricks to make it easier for the patient to actually get their, get their medicine. And that has been very successful. Um, it's now morphed to two people full time. That's all they do. Um, but it's really nice that the, uh, they're not pharmacists, they're not pharmacy techs, but they're experts in the bureaucracy of getting the prescriptions filled and are there to advocate to help the patient get that done. The other one that we're a little earlier with, you know, we're in early in utilization is care management. We've had some, um, we recently actually hired an RN that's a full-time, we call a health coach. We're learning how to use that. We're really excited about this because as you start to get data, and we're starting to get data taking care of people, you can start to re recognize those people who use a lot of resources. So, you know, it's the old rule that you know, 10 to 50 of the patients, you know, churn up 80% of the cost. When you can identify those people, you actually start to focus on them. That's where you're going to spend your time and energy. And having someone to help identify that and also help coordinate that care is um, something we're really excited about. Physicians and, to a lesser extent, extent APRNs are kind of territorial sometimes. And some of the challenges we've had over the years is getting them to let go, to have people actually help them take care of their patients better. And that's been a journey we've been on for, for quite a while. It was kind of a jolt when we first started doing these particular prescriptions, but it's been successful. Um, finally, the final scenes that uh, centered around Dartmouth Hitchcock really sort of drove home the example of the distorted payment mechanism that here we have Dartmouth doing the right thing in regards to spinal surgery, which is not a cheap date, nor is it a riskless date, um, and how they subsequently lose so much money because they're doing the right thing. And again, drives home the whole issue of being there, trying to bend how people are being, how our healthcare system is being paid or supported to actually keep people healthy rather than do lots of things that are not risk-free. So, um, I think I'll probably stop there and kind of pass on to guys that are smarter than me, but in a nutshell, I think is what we sort of have. So we already have kind of a, have a running start of what they're doing in different communities. The healthcare costs in New Hampshire and the nation have been rising for about a dozen years, well faster than average wages, well faster than average business profits, well faster than gross domestic profit at the state and national level. Um, there was a, actually um, supporting what a couple of folks said in the in the film, um, the Institute of Medicine, which is made up of experts from a number of fields, including clinicians, came out with a report in just this September that, that actually had the same assertion that about 30% of health care cost nationwide is waste. It's, it's, um, it's, body, it's, it's premised on inefficiencies, it's premised on care that isn't um, appropriate or even necessary. You know. um, again, talked about it in the film. At the same time, we are among industrialized countries in the world, all of whom already cover all of their residents. We have the lowest health care quality rankings in the world, again, for, for many of the reasons that are talked about here. So in that context, these models are, they're not just good news, they are remarkable news. Insurance plans and healthcare providers, hospital systems, physicians really are beginning to understand the system we have is not 
sustainable. It cannot continue to work the way it is. And now I'm supposed to talk about policy, I know, and, 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 and policy is, you know, changing systems is, is not an easy trick. Um, and, um, and in the context of policy, there is a legitimate question, there's a really big question about what role does government have in this? When you look at these examples of places that have done these systems transformation, they weren't about government, I'm not an anti-government guy, by the way, but I, they, they were not about government intervention. You know, there, there are like extraordinary examples of community leadership and of of folks in the community, but also of people in the health, in, in the health system world exercising sort of extraordinary um, leadership. That said, there are both smart leverage points and incentives that government can, at the state level and the federal level, can and does provide and encourage. And I'm, I'm not going to be political about this, but I'm going to mention the Affordable Care Act and just say that the, the Affordable Care Act embraces and provides incentives and demonstration grants for the development of these very types of systems. What, what, um, what Fred referred to as, as ACOs, kind of care organizations, and primary care medical homes. So for changing um, the delivery of care so that it's based on quality and on patient outcomes, um, instead of being about quantity. Um, at the same time, at the state level in New Hampshire, there are a couple things that are going on for leverage purposes. So, you know, how do these changes happen? How do they happen at the community level? Is there a way to help leverage them, you know, at the state level? And New Hampshire's Insurance Department and Department of Human Services have, have, have undertaken grant-funded, federally grant-funded work um, to try to increase transparency around healthcare costs so that everyone can have a better understanding of is how much does all this stuff cost? What parts of it co cost what? Of health insurance premiums. Okay, we can find out how much of it is profit for health insurance companies and how much of it is administrative cost for health insurance companies, but how much of it is healthcare cost? And, and the appearance over the last several years, it, 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 while a lot of fingers were pointed during public debate about insurance companies, it is health care costs that are driving insurance premium costs dramatically in our state and, all, and actually all around the nation. So, so wanting to create systems and require both health care providers and insurance companies to submit information that allows the public and policymakers and anyone and the customers, the patients of places, to understand what they're being charged and why, because we don't have that kind of a transparent market right now. So to do that because it provides a leverage, to do that because there's an embarrassment quotient, because hospital systems and providers will want to have good numbers that are helpful numbers for the public, because they'll want to be able to compete with each other. Um, in a certain sense, to be better systems, to be systems that work better for people. So that transparency is aimed in that direction. I'll just say one more thing about government, and that is that, that, that or current, current policy, and that is the Department of Health and Human Services is transitioning, or is in the process of transitioning its Medicaid program to Medicaid managed care. And built into that systems change is, an, is, an, is a a conscious effort to engage with and encourage accountable care organizations and primary care and medical homes that are delivering care in the sort of the most, in, in the highest quality and most cost effective way. So I'll, I'll just say um, one last thing about this. And that, that's, I mean, I, I don't, although there all are these government and sort of policy incentives around this, that still doesn't take the place of the kind of community that, you, that we all saw in this. And it's not just about physicians and hospital systems and healthcare providers. It's about all of us. It's about community members engaging in dialogue with <coughs> the managers and board members of those organizations. First of all, I agree with the point you made was about Carroll County. You mentioned that, that's something the, the 
those of us on the State Committee in Asia are very concerned about, that we don't have uh, the infrastructure within counties. Even though many areas um, over the years, many areas in New Hampshire have gone to le great lengths often to attract uh, sort of younger, older people, younger, older, affluent people, I should say, into communities. Um, I don't think they've taken into account that these younger, young old, affluent people will become old old <laughs> at some point, and that the facilities to address the needs of those people uh, probably won't be there. So that is one thing they're, they're concerned, we're concerned about. I, I wanted to pick up on a, a few things um, Tom said. I may shorten my presentation because he addressed some of them, but, and I, I'd like to give time for comment from the audience and um, questions. Uh, my reaction in, in watching this film, and this is the third time that I've seen it, uh, was to be both excited and sober. I mean, I found it exciting and sober. Um, and I'm someone, I guess, also who's been involved in healthcare reform efforts for many years. Uh, going way back, I served on President Clinton's healthcare task force for several years in the 1990s. I, I chaired a group uh, called the New Hampshire Healthcare Coalition, which was a broad coalition of organizations that tried to raise the issue of, of, of healthcare reform. And uh, now I'm on the State Committee, Chair of the State Committee on Aging, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the Dartmouth Health Atlas, and I'm persuaded by the evidence that they've raised and others have raised that some X amount, we don't really know, anywhere I guess from 20%, uh, I think the CBO, Congressional Budget Office, came up with a figure of of 20% and the Dartmouth people and the Institute of Medicine, as Tom mentioned, uh, came out with a figure 30% of our spending on health care is wasted. It's hard not to be persuaded when you see the disparities between and among communities in the United States in terms of what's spent. And you see that they have the same outcomes. Uh, there were some studies that the, the Dartmouth people have done showing that um, there are differences within the same hospital systems between hospitals in terms of what they spend on the exact same diagnoses, and they have very different outcomes. There have been, there have been some criticisms of the Dartmouth Health Atlas and, and the Dartmouth work. I think they've responded to them, and anybody who's interested, I, I encourage to go to their site. It's, it's pretty user-friendly, and um, I think uh, they rapidly respond to, to criticism. So I, I do think uh, a, a more adequate healthcare system is within we reach, given that we, we waste so much money within our healthcare system. And I think Tom is absolutely right in, in terms of the figures he cited about where the United States stands in the world, and I, I think it's particularly something we should, what, um, be embarrassed about, given the amount of money we spend on health care. The question I have, and I guess it's the sobering thing, again, trying not to be political here, um, but the sobering thing for me is, how do we get to a broad national system that looks like some of the uh, examples and role models I guess that's what they really are, that we, we saw in this film. How do we reorganize our, our deliver, delivery system and, and persuade providers to change practice patterns? Um, how do all of us, um, I can see how we can do it in some communities, but I wonder how we do it across the country. How do we imitate the low cost, high quality areas um, that we, we saw in this film. Now, New Hampshire is an interesting because we do have some very high quality areas in this state, but as, as Tom, I think, alluded to, we do have high cost areas 
and many of the low, many of the high quality areas are also high cost. So I think that's an issue that needs to be addressed. I'm not trying to rain, I guess, in this parade to use your expression, but but I think um, a lot of this will be a long haul. It's been a long haul. It was it already has been a long haul. It was Theodore Roosevelt who first uh, raised the issue of national health insurance in 1912. That's how, how far back people have been struggling over this issue. I, I think we really do have a long haul. Um, and then there's a larger question, which I think Tom somewhat allu alluded to, that I'll just mention. Um, I think there's a larger issue, uh, and I don't know how we deal with this, but the larger issue of why are so many people in such poor health in this country, often compared uh, to other countries. There's a whole, there's a plethora of evidence, and again, I say this, I try to say this in the most non-political way, that inequality plays a key role in the health of populations. And I think, um, and I'll just say it quickly, but I think we have to keep in mind um, that we, when we look at the industrialized countries, um, increasingly we're the most unequal of the industrialized countries. And if this evidence, uh, primarily from Europe and Canada, uh, is true, um, it doesn't bode well for our country. I think that's a larger issue that, that we have to deal with. We just have to constantly harp on those environmental things that, that make staying healthy easier. Um, Keene's a good example of New Hampshire. Um, the, the idea is having, you know, making a walkable city um, to have programs that really focus on staying healthy, which includes the schools. Um, we need to be very supportive with clinicians and we support public health initiatives. We develop ways to monitor the health of our community, so we can have a community health report card, if you will, because I think people do respond to data. And finally, um, as clinicians need to live what we preach. In our, in our, in the context of, of the interstate budget, um, continue to invest in wellness and prevention education and efforts in communities. Um, that our best practice and that are proven to succeed would be a very helpful thing to do. It's not an easy thing to do in the context of our state budget. We, we live in a, you know, New Hampshire has a tradition of fiscal restraint at the state level that, it, that, can be, that can be challenging. And when we're talking about wellness and keeping people healthy and well, a longer term view than the two year state budget cycle is required because it requires some investment of dollars up front. <coughs> And then there is savings over time in terms of people being healthier. And it's, it makes it a harder case to make to policymakers, but it's a, it's a case that I think folks are trying to come together um, in collaborative and strategic fashion to try to make it to policymakers. Well, I, I agree with the two of them. And to, turn, and to make sure, just to say this very quickly, as quickly as I can, maybe I can just recommend another film that I think was on PBS, a series. I don't know if any of you saw it. It was called Unnatural Causes which looks at the connections between inequality and health and the importance to, and it looks at communities that have increased social capital, tried to narrow gaps between and among populations. And, and those are the kinds of things that I think we also need to complement. Well, the good news is that they figured out that if you keep people healthy, their medical expenditures are less. So they get more money to keep. So it's interesting that just in two weeks, I'm going down to Anthem where they're convening a whole medical home they call the PC2 project, which is beginning to support uh, medical homes with different payment models, um, which we've been fighting for for a long time. Cigna's talking the same dance now. Um, they're supplying us with some of the data that they, they talked about here about management, you know, the Ever Clinic that Blue Cross came over and said, oh, we have all this data. Well, they've had this data for the years they didn't want to share. Um, now that we get that information, you can start to do some actionable stuff. So they figured out that it's expensive to get sick in the United States, so it's probably a good idea to stay well. So the medical home pilots 
in New Hampshire was part of that data um, has shown significant savings. Uh, just recently in the journal Managed Care this month showed 14% reduction in health care costs when you compare medical home populations versus the rest of the population. That's a lot of money. I know our own experience with Anthem and the, the pilot that Genie's Groups sponsored, in one year we saved Anthem $2 million. They didn't share. <laughs> um, but the point is that, that, that it's those pilots were all designed to show the proof of concept. It does show that. So I think you're going to see that role start more and more because they're keeping score with cash and it does, and everyone wins. So that's kind of nice. You asked the question how are we going to get doctors to change their way of thinking along the lines that we saw in the film? Um, I think it has to begin in med school. You know, at the very budding of these young careers, nobody joins the diplomatic corps to make a lot of money. They join the diplomatic corps to go out and save the world. And I think that somewhere in a future doctor's education, we have to instill the notion that what you're doing has to be for the greater good of whatever community you wind up working in. I know that there have been some efforts in this area at the Dartmouth Medical School, but I don't have any idea how widespread it is across other med schools. And I was wondering, Fred, is this even possible to instill this kind of notion in, in med students? And they all say they go to medical school with the same idea that they're going to go out and be doctors, and then the bills mount up, and they realize that they financially cannot enter, a, you know, the, the slice of, of medical care, you know, especially primary care, and be able to meet those 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 bills. So a lot come in, and they sheepishly tell me when I ask them, "Well, what do you want to do with your life?" And they say, "Well, I'm going to be a surgeon." And be a radiologist, ophthalmologist. I really don't want to do that, but I need the money. Yeah. Um, that's pretty universal. Um, and we try to sway the real smart ones, and we would need smart guys like you on the front line. And some do it, they do it because it's a calling. Um, and others can't because they can't afford it. I think it highlights the systemic nature of the problem. That, that, it's easy to blame insurers, it's easy to blame physicians. Um, it, it's really a systemic problem um, that we face. And I think to address the systemic problem, you really have to attack it in a comprehensive way. You can't do it in a piecemeal way. And, um, you know, I, for better or worse, we don't know how to play itself out. I, I think the Affordable Care Act does try to do that. I don't want to beat a dead horse with that, but I, I think it does. I was just going to say, I think there are a couple of different leverage points. One is, one is, one is there are big questions about whether medical school actually needs to cost as much as it does, so that, that's, but that's a question I'll put out there. The, the other is that at both the state and federal level, there are different levels of loan forgiveness for folks who commit to being physicians in underserved areas, for right. example. So there, there, there are, and again, these are, these are, yes, these are tax-funded, you know, programs, but they are programs that actually tend to alter um, the, the, the dynamics that the other people have been involved that Fred was mentioning. So, you know, I don't know whether anybody did that. There's, you know, there's this old show about Alaska, the, the dock in Alaska. Um, well, yeah. Northern Exposure. Um, was an example of a doc who was, you know, who agreed to, to do this if his loans were forgiven and he got shipped way up to some little place in the last that ended up being a wonderful place. But there are, there are, there's the opportunity for programs like that. And there is some funding for doing some of that um, in the ACA, but probably not enough. And it's, it's, a, it's a dialogue that we need to continue to have because it's, it's an issue, it's a problem. One person's cost is another person's income. And so you have to be cognizant of the fact that if you're going to realign the financing and cut costs, somebody is not going to make as much money. 
I work here at Plymouth State at the Center for Rural Partnerships and the Health and Social Welfare Coordinator, but I'm also a CAGS student in clinical mental health here at Plymouth State. So I'm in the process of transitioning, um, making a mid-career change. So I have, I have a couple of observations um, uh, with my mental health hat on, and that is it strikes me that mental health is not being mentioned um, in this whole conversation. I would love to hear your thoughts as it relates to integrated primary care, um, but also thinking about the aging of the graying of New Hampshire, and particularly in the rural areas of New Hampshire, um, my other research interest is geriatric mental health. And so I'm curious as to whether or not you believe, as I do, that a part of the solution, um, particularly when it comes to elder care, is to integrate uh, mental health services with primary care services and having uh, more than just adequate, but but full mental health care in the primary care setting so that a primary care doc or the behavioral health specialist on staff could be doing those assessments, screenings, all those sorts of things that would save the referring out for mental health services because we know that mental health is essentially a specialty care. So I'd like to hear any of your thoughts as it relates to integrated primary care and particularly mental health services no, yes, I agree completely with everything you said. I, mean, I, I don't know how to go beyond it. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right. The, the, um, the best concept of the medical home is one that integrates primary care and mental health and substance use disorder um, and oral health. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think to repeat what Jeannie said, I think Mid State Health Center and for Fred Shop is a is a prize example um, in our midst of an organization that is that is both that is uh, is already accomplishing some of that, and I think seeks to do even more, bringing oral health in. But I'll, I'll turn to you about that. Every patient walks through our door and has a psychosocial like issue associated with their medical disease. Uh, mental health and what I call biologic health have been in silos for decades. Um, we. Uh, it was actually Vince Scalise and I decided years ago we wanted to put our offices together. And we made that happen in the mid 2000s and became fully integrated, including our electronic record, which is none of the game notes has done that, so that there is absolute free flow and shared records between our behavioral health folks and the biologic people. It's been a very cool journey. Um, we've learned that there's only special people can do that. Um, our patients find it um, a little daunting in the beginning they, in that, oh, you can do that right here. And we find it amazing that a patient does come in and they finally, you know, we finally find a major life crisis. We can actually go down the upper hallway and go, oh, well, we need some extra help and we can bring it right then. Because we find the most effective mental health and behavioral health interventions occur when the crisis is occurring, not two weeks later when you make the appointment. Um, so that's been very powerful. When we finally were able to get that kind of service down to our Bristol office, um, it just made a huge difference as well. I mean, the whole, everybody gains. I have to say that they provide therapy for all of us. Um, and to enter the whole office and our support staff actually is that much better because we have behavioral health people, you know, PhD level uh, folks there. We don't do specialty mental health. Um, you know, when you start getting into the really bad bipolars and psychotics, I mean, that's different, and that's something that we can't really do well in primary care right now. But but it's been a really, I could talk for hours on what we learned from that, our mistakes, and what was powerful, but um, yeah, it works really well, and you're spot on, and come visit us someday. And I'm surprised that, that I haven't heard the word wellness uh, in all of this. Um, it, we've been talking about a, a the system that's needed to treat sick people, and there's been some allusion to the fact that uh, keeping people healthy is a good idea. Uh, but in point of fact, uh, it's the culture that we have, that, we're, that we live in in America, that contributes to the demand and the expectations and the fact that uh, people have a sense in our culture, apparently, that, that uh, they can live a life that, that, that maybe have consequences that can be cured rather than, than living a life uh, that, that would avoid these consequences to begin with. 
the drug takers, which are very high in New Hampshire. We have an obesity rate that's very high in New Hampshire. We have other uh, practices as people that that make that put a real challenging strain on whatever health system uh, we have. And I'm just wondering whether there's a science that's um, investigating the, the notion of, of uh, personal responsibility and, and cultural res uh, cultural uh, programs that, that will uh, change this behavior. I'm in New Hampshire for how to do this. It's called the Healthy Eating Active Living Coalition, HEAL. And w what they're trying to do is um, uh, in part to re well, focus on reducing or preventing childhood obesity and helping the rest of us get eat better, be more active, uh, so that we will be healthier. And they have determined, and this is, I think, a national trend, that rather than wagging the finger at us, and I can tell you personally, I can wag the finger at myself in the mirror just about every day, but it doesn't change my behavior. Policy level change is much more effective um, in promoting healthy behaviors, and I think their work through the schools, through uh, school nutrition, through activity, uh, having more physical activity, more recess for kids, more PE, all of those things are policy level changes that I think could help our state move forward. And they are pulling together people from across all sectors in the state, from businesses to restaurants, menus to school cafeterias, uh, to help make these changes. But So to give you a real a practical example, I'm going to go back to the childhood obesity one. Um, there's a mess that's just reported by HEAL called 5210. Uh, fried fruits and vegetables a day, two hours of exercise, less than two hours of screen time a day, one hour of exercise, and zero sugar sweet beverages. That's been an excellent way the HEAL folks have been able to unify on both what is happening in the primary care offices with pediatricians and family physicians talking to parents and their kids and having the posters about 5210 and talking with parents and engaging in conversations about those types of habits for their kids. On the public health and community front, we see communities are taking that message and in their after school programs, in their school wellness coalitions, are adopting that same message out there uh, to how do we encourage and have exercise in our after school program times. Looking at our menus for what we're doing and offering for snacks or after school program. So you just raise an issue that is so important. Um, glad to speak to you more or anyone else who's interested in this in terms of unifying our messages so that we can have an active front on both sides, both in the office and outside the office.